we will now focus our attention on the behavior of inflation and money growth over time. Let's start by looking at some data. In these tables, we can see inflation and money growth rates for 57 countries and large periods of time all the way up to 2011. There are some overall patterns we can discern across the observed time frame. Inflation was greater than zero for all countries. Deflation, that is, an overall decrease in prices, was not observed for any country in our sample period. The lowest inflation rate was 1.7% per year for Singapore between 1991 and 2011. Japan has experienced deflation over the period of 2000 to 2013 at an average rate of minus 0.14%. However, prices start to rise again after that. Overall, median inflation was about 7.3% per year, and the growth rate of currency, just as inflation, was also above zero for virtually all countries, with the median being 13.6% per year. Of particular interest for the analysis that will follow, the growth rate of currency exceeded the inflation for most countries, which made the median growth rate of real currency to increase between 1960 and 2011 at about 4.6%. This is not far from the median growth rate of real GDP of about 3.35%. Another feature of note we see in the data is the very strong association between inflation rates and the growth rate of nominal currency. As we can observe in this figure, the correlation is very, very high, up to 0.92. This led Milton Friedman, who we know from before regarding the permanent income hypothesis, to say that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We now turn our attention to the dynamics of inflation and interest rates. The dollar value of assets held as bonds rises over the year by the factor 1 plus i. The interest rate i is called the nominal interest rate because it determines the change over time in the nominal value of assets held as bonds. Since the real interest rate in period 1 is the rate at which asset held as bonds change in real value, we have that 1 plus the real rate must equate 1 plus the nominal rate over 1 plus the inflation rate. Take logs and use the result that for values close to zero, the natural logarithm of 1 plus x is approximately equal to x. Then we can write the real rate as the difference between the nominal and inflation rates. Remember that for intertemporal substitution effects, it is the real rate that matters. Not also, the inflation rate is the difference between the price level in period 2 and period 1. But as of time 1, period 2 is in the future, and therefore one can only form expectations about what the inflation rate will be. This will make it so that the real interest rate between period 1 and 2 is also unknown as of period 1. Hence, the expected real rate will be determined by the expected inflation rate. In this table, we have an example on how all these objects relate to each other. Lines 1 and 2 show the effect of the inflation rate on the price level. Lines 3 and 4 show the effect of the nominal interest rate on the change over time in the nominal value of assets. Lines 5 and 6 show the effects of the nominal interest rate and the inflation rate on the change over time in the real value of assets. The change in the real value of assets depends on the real interest rate, which equals the difference between the nominal interest rate and the inflation rate. This naturally raises the question of how to measure inflation's expectations. There are essentially three ways. The first is simply to ask people about what they think inflation will be. The second is to use rational expectations, which says that expectations correspond to optimal forecasts, given the available information. Then, just use statistical techniques to gauge these optimal forecasts. The last is to use market data to infer expectations on inflation. In this figure, we have the consumer price index as a measure of inflation from 1950 until after 2010 in light blue. In dark blue, we have the Livingston Expected Inflation Index, which is based on survey data about people's expectations of inflation. 
This suggests that expectation surveys do a good job at capturing inflation dynamics, notwithstanding the differences in volatility. If we want to compute the expected real interest rate, we can use the T-bill nominal rate, depicted in light blue in this figure, and subtract inflation expectations. This gives us the time series for expected real rates in dark blue. Alternatively, as mentioned, we can use market data to infer inflation's expectations. Indexed government bonds are bonds where the interest and principal payouts are adjusted for realized inflation. These bonds, therefore, guarantee the real interest rate at the end of maturity. If we compare the market prices between index versus non-index bonds, we can back out the market-implied expected real rate of return. What we see in this figure is the computed real interest rate on inflation-protected U.S. Treasury bonds. The light blue graph is for 5-year maturity, the dark blue graph for 10-year maturity, and the black for 30-year maturity. To back out inflation expectations, we take the normal interest rate on U.S. Treasury bonds and subtract the real interest rate that we just computed. As before, we can back out expected inflation rates over different time horizons, here shown for 5 years in light blue, 10 years in dark blue, and 30 years in black.